I thought, oh, we could just get this car and I'll just drive it. And it'll sound cool and uh, I'll just drive it. And I was I wrong. If you've been watching us for a while, you're probably wondering why I'm sitting in front of an Audi. This is a 2007 Audi S8 and it has a 5.2 liter V10 in it. Now that's the V10 everybody says, the Lamborghini V10, and it kind of is, but it's, it is, but it's not. This is how I like to call it, like, you have the LS3 in the Corvette, and then you have the 6.2 in the Escalade. Pretty much the same thing, guts are a little bit different. This is like the L94 truck engine version of the Lamborghini and Audi R8 engines and I always wanted one of these in high school so why do we have one well in high school I drove my dad's 2008 Suburban and I kept blowing up the 4L60 in it and then Mr. Forbes my dad's best friend who used to own the Rolls Royce that we have he had a 2008 Audi A8L that he had just traded in on a newer one at their other friend's car dealership my dad thought huh I wonder what Forbes Audi is worth we go there, find out that the blue book is almost exactly the same for both of them. And he thought it would be harder for me to break the Audi than to keep blowing up the transmission in the Suburban. So we just traded for him. So I drove this Audi A8 uh, for my senior year of high school. And shortly after that, that's what I drove before the Escalade came up. That car had a 4.2 liter V, 4.2 liter V8. It was just not very fast. I wanted it to be. That's kind of what got me into racing and all that, you know, um, definitely legally is how that happened. I always daydreamed about having the V10 version, one, because it was faster, two, because they sound freaking sweet. But that still doesn't answer the question, why is this sitting here? Well, I was thinking the seats in the Monte Carlo were not very comfortable. And I thought, what could we pull from a junkyard or find on eBay Motors or something that would be a good seat to put in there that I know is comfortable? And I was thinking, hmm, my Audi in high school was probably the most comfortable front seats I ever sat in. And I really liked the way the center console worked. It had lots of different compartments in it. It was really adjustable, nice height for your elbow and all that. So I go on Facebook Marketplace and start looking for Audi A8 seats or parts cars, part outs, things like that. I find this car. It's priced like a parts car. So I click on it, but it's not a parts car. It's a complete functional car and allegedly everything works perfectly. And I thought, oh dang, I really feel like we should buy this. So we did. And it was extremely slow, like so freaking slow. thought it had a trailer hooked to it it was slower than my v8 audi a8 was and this thing's supposed to have 100 more horsepower but it ran like it had freaking 220 figured there's got to be something wrong with this thing so start digging into it and the previous owner of the previous owner deleted the intake flaps because they were broken so I, I lit, initially i thought maybe that's why the power is so far down but it just didn't add up. So I thought, okay, maybe there's a vacuum leak. Feeling around, spraying with this bottle, which is still here, because I just started tearing things apart once I found a, a bead. I just went in right in on it. This right here, somebody tightened this down like a gorilla and cracked the heck out of it so bad that it was not sealing with the throttle body. So you can see this one's fine. This one had a big gap right here it was sucking in air here and here so I thought all right I just got to get this mouthpiece thing here off and fix it I had noticed on the edge CTS 3 monitor that the mass airflow reading was saying it would only ever say like one or two pounds an hour and that just didn't mean it make any sense I mean it should change when you do stuff with the pedal it didn't change at all and I was like, hmm, maybe the connectors are loose or something. So that was in the back of my mind too. To get that mouthpiece and throttle body off, I had to pull this tube off here, which goes on here. And I went to take it off and it just came right off. There was no clamp on the end here. 
the mass airflow sensor is right there. So one, it's sucking air out around this. It was sucking air in through the throttle body. And when I'm taking all that off, I notice this thing is freaking loose as heck. It's all over the place. And that goes right into the intake manifold. So there's a massive, massive vacuum leak right here. And I could actually hear it. Whenever I was spraying stuff around, I heard what, it almost sounded like refrigerant going through a, an AC line. Because I've heard that sound before. So I was kind of like, I don't know if that's vacuum leak or if that's just the AC system. Because I don't know what the normal sounds for this car are yet. Because when you get something that's messed up, you don't have that baseline audio bouquet of normalness that you can kind of like work from. Once I found this, I knew that's where that hissing was coming from. This is the PCV uh, system. It comes out of here and this is a little bung that it connects to. And on top of that, taking this apart, this is there's missing bolts in here. There were no, never any bolts in here. There's missing bolts in there. Whoever put this car back together just like did not even, oh yeah, this is broken. They didn't freaking do very good of anything as far as nut discipline goes. They have very, very bad nut discipline because they lost a bunch of them. But to get to that little piece there, you have to pull the intake manifold off. And I didn't mention this already, but this car leaks oil. These engines are notorious for leaking oil. One of the places it comes out of is where the oil filter housing mates to the valley of the block. It pulls up in there and then it drips out these little wheat poles up here, which I can see. It looks like a front seal leak, but it's usually coming from those wheat poles. So if you take a flashlight and look down there and if it looks all wet, then it's probably coming out of where under this thing is. So if we're gonna pull the intake off to get to that, we can fix that leak. I think the valve covers are leaking too. So we got valve cover gaskets, we're gonna fix those. I mean, both of them, you can see it's foggy down there. It wasn't dripping a ton, but the underside is all soggy and when you park it and move it the next day, there'd be like, you know, a line of drips pretty much everywhere you'd set the car. The last owner, um, I guess he wasn't super proficient at working on anything. So he just left it exactly the way it was from the guy before. Not that this really matters because this is my problem now, but I got the number of the guy he bought it from to ask him about the flap delete and stuff. And I started saying like, man, I found out why it was running so bad because uh, this thing's all cracked to heck. And he's like, oh, I don't know what the next guy did with it. Ha <laughs> ha. Like, man, it's missing all kinds of bolts too. Like way down in here on these fuel lines and stuff because he told me he changed the fuel lines. He's like, no, I put them all back when I put it back together. I don't know what the next guy did to it. I'm always very thorough and I'm like, well, I read people. I met the kid I bought this from. Pretty honest kid. Just didn't really know what he was doing. He could not have gotten in here. <laughs> so the dude before was uh, something else. Tell you what. So I don't know what we're going to find when we get in here as we move in further. We're going to open up this intake manifold, see what's going on. He allegedly did the carbon cleaning on the valves have pictures of that but I wouldn't be surprised if we find that like one cylinder was cleaned so he could take a picture before and after and the rest of them are still cruddy so I'm prepared to have to do that again too don't know carbon cleaning is a big deal on these engines if you get one with higher miles and it feels like a dog it's got carbon issues on the valves because it's direct injected and these PCV systems fail there's a lot of oil ends up in the manifold that's part of what causes the, the variable flaps to break because it has a long runner path and a short runner path. So when you take them out, it's just turbulent air everywhere, just bad all around. It's not really one or the other. And you end up with oil in the back of the valves. There's no fuel to spray it off because the fuel is going right into the cylinder. It gets caked up, hard, crusty, blocks flow. Everything is bad. That's what we're working with here. I figured I'd, I wasn't gonna film this because I thought this process would be quick but now it's turned into a whole big job. And uh, let's get to work. Got this clamp off here, let's see what's in here. Why is it brown? There's rusty water has been through here. Uh, would not be surprised if that MAF sensor is dead. Did this car suck up water? <laughs> This one doesn't look like that. Something tells me we are in for something 
more than this with this car. You know, if it ends up being a total electrical basket case, then we have a donor engine to use in something else because it's been in the back of my mind for a long time to V10 swap something because I just, I love the way these engines sound. Aside from, you know, a 9500 RPM cup engine, if it's not a V8, th this V10, or maybe not this V10, but like the Lamborghini 5 liter V10 with the split pin crank is the best sound. That's my favorite. And why they sound like this is a whole nother lesson in itself. These engines have the split pin crankshaft, which means, to put it quickly, 10 cylinders fire every, you know, four rotations of the engine, it gets all 10 of them. So they have a fire, a cylinder fires every 72 degrees, where a V8 that fires every 90 degrees gets all of them because you take the number of cylinders divided by 720, I think, something like that. If you got a, and the, the Ford V10s have a split, split pin crank too, so call it an even fire versus odd fire. The 2008 and up, I believe, R8s and Lamborghini, Gallardos and Herbicons have odd firing V10s that have a 90 degree crankshaft. That's why they sound deeper and not as kind of Mm, tight is this one because it's taking more than a full cycle of the engine to get all 10 cylinders to light off we can explain that better later but this is kind of a weird hybrid even though it is like the the garden variety version of the 5.2 it has the split pin crankshaft like the Lamborghini 5 liter did so it sounds more like that engine than the other one even though it's on the newer architecture just found another one there's nothing on here. Nothing. You could probably see that in the earlier clip where I pulled it off. I didn't even see it until I went to pop this one off right here. This is wide freaking open. So whether that works or not, there's probably no freaking air coming through those nav sensors at all. None. <laughs> I wouldn't even be surprised if the intake manifold gaskets themselves are not seated correctly with the way this guy put this car together. Went to move this line. Figured if I took it off here, I could flex it out of the way to get that bolt out. And then the fitting that it's connected to down here just turned. Like it's, this thing was probably <laughs> not that far away from having a nasty fuel leak right down the back of the engine onto the exhaust. And I know the dude that is denying he did any of this to this car is gonna watch this video and I don't really care, man. This is just freaking dangerous. What are you doing? Put down the wrench. Get a desk job, please. I undid this with my fingers, man. That's not cool. Probably don't need to take this off, but it'll make life easier. Now, normally, there's gonna be this little bundle of wires and a bracket that's bolted to the front bottom of this that apparently is really hard to get to. That I've read a lot of people complaining about the difficulty of on forums. One plus to the person who put this car back together being a complete total hack is that they didn't bolt that back on. It's just chilling down there. Take the good with the bad. Lots of oil in here. 99% chance possibility it's coming out of this gasket right here. One of the most common oil leaks on this engine for S6 and S8. I'm also gonna change this gasket while I'm in here just cause, well, we're in here, why not do that? Depending how frisky I'm feeling, we may even take the injectors out and send them out to be clean too. I feel like that's probably the right thing to do. This right here is the bundle of stuff that was not bolted back onto the intake. Honestly, I may not even do that either, just because how difficult it is to take it on and off. We might find a better way to do that that doesn't involve uh, not leaving it disconnected, but also not making it super hard to get back off. If he did carbon clean, he may have, and this thing may have just been running so badly that it 
started to come back. We're gonna take these uh, little dividers out of here. We don't need those anymore. I'm seeing all kinds of things in here I don't like. All kinds of connectors with you know, missing locks on them, stuff just sort of flapping in the breeze. You pay eight grand for a car that every other version of it is like 12 to 15. Maybe there's a reason it was for sale for so long. Taking the coils out, they were soaked in oil, probably causing all kinds of misfires. Look how much oil is down there. Look at that. It's almost all the way to the top of the spark plug. Every single one of those has oil in it. Oh no. Oh well. Be like that sometimes, I guess. Split this manifold open. See what's inside here. That's a lot of oil. Grinding away on this for a while now. Valve cover gasket is super dry, all cracked. I can see where somebody, I should have shown this, but I was in the zone. The valve cover had to be modified because they changed it somehow. Uh, I had to cut a passage and cut some plastic out to get this uh, ring of the whole way around. But whoever did this before just cut this out of the gasket doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that uh, there's no no sealing going on there so kind of creates a weak spot probably why they revised the valve cover design to have this completely closed like all the other ones but they're just so hard so brittle changed all the camshaft adjuster seals those were they feel like plastic too all four of them, one right there, 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 and there. Those are common leak points also. Now I'm working on the oil filter housing seal, which is this figure eight thingy here. That is where the oil is coming that was filling up the valley. Comes out to the wheat poles there. Chilling right here probably because it's full of oil. I don't want it to leak everywhere. I got another one of these O-rings right here. That one's not bad, but I'm gonna change it anyway because I'm in there. Kind of looks like R2D2. I am gonna take the injectors out and get them cleaned because why not? We're already in here. This has been uh, quite the project, I will say. From what started is I'm gonna fix this simple vacuum leak. Turned into basically a mechanical refresh of everything under the hood that is not the internals of the engine. Oh man, these injectors have been a pain in the butt. These two were pretty hard. These ones are not screwed up yet, but I'm being nice to them. This slide hammer will destroy stuff if you are impatient with it or your injectors are really, really stuck like mine are. Working on making some type of something to be able to grab the the stem part because once the that once this plastic gets rounded off, like this one here, there's nothing to grab. So if we can make something that will slide over this part here and go into this, so you could have like a little clam shell that would go around the stem of the injector and then go into the regular slide hammer attachment. Then it would be pulling on the metal, wouldn't be pulling on the plastic, wouldn't break it. Because got all new injectors, didn't plan on doing that. Ordered all that, gaskets and everything from FCP Euro, because that seems to be like the thing to do. And we got a bunch of connectors here to replace. All of the screwed up ones, you're gonna have to pop the pins out and change those. So that's gonna be fun. 
and that doesn't even get to replacing this rusty MAF sensor or this messed up Y bridge piece here. It's just a lot. Oh, and the oil and the spark plug wells. I'm gonna have to figure some out. I think I slide a rubber tube in there that goes between the wall and the coil snout. Keeps oil from coming in through there because that comes in through the cam carriers, not the valve cover. To take the cam carriers out, change that gasket, that is an engine out job and we're not doing that. So all these connectors that have lost their clips are gonna be changed one by one. I think that's what I'm gonna start working on right now. For all you regulars, yeah, I probably could be spending time working on the Monte Carlo or the Suburban or something, but you know, it's just one of those things. I thought, oh, we could just get this car and I'll just drive it and it'll sound cool and uh, I'll just drive it. That was I wrong. Now I'm not showing all the carbon cleaning stuff. There's plenty of videos on how to do that. Um, car wizard, the wizard guy. Uh, his video is basically the one I referenced to do this, except I used oven cleaner. But all those videos say, okay, well, you do the, the cylinders that are, with the valves that are closed, and then you bar the motor over and do it. Well, barring the motor on the, oh, bleh, barring the motor over on the S6 and S8 is not just like a straightforward put a socket on it kind of deal, because you can't get to the crankshaft. And so they say, all right, do it with the alternator nut. Well, you go on the forums and they, they remove the core support in the service position to access the alternator net. No, not doing that. So I made my own tool. Consisted of cutting about that much off the end of a 15 16 socket, which is matches up to the 24 millimeter nut on there because it had more random standard Jeep sockets laying around. And then I put, so I had a collar of a socket about that thick and then I put another 15 16 bolt into it with some paper towels wedged in there to see if it would move before I welded it. And then it got this ratchet wrench on here. Now the ratchet wrench fits perfectly. Oh, the bolt just came out. I might have to weld it. You can see there. Basically, uh, here, there's the collar. Now I know I can weld that bolt into there with a little bit of the end sticking out like that and I can use the ratchet wrench to bar the motor over really easily without having to take the core support off and put it into service position. I'm not taking the freaking core support off. Screw that. I know you don't want to do that either. So, And I was able to cut this socket with uh, the porta band swag off the table. Pretty sweet. This is the last injector in the head. It is not messed up currently. We're gonna use the prototype tool here to see if it will come out without screwing it up. This is the true test to find out if this tool's gonna to work or not. And I just realized I put the freaking slide hammer attachment on upside down because I'm dumb. Made the attachment with the wrong thread, so we had to weld the bolt to a nut to make it work for this. We'd redo it so it would screw right into this regular slide hammer tool deal here. Oh. oh. God, look at that. Disgusting. What? I don't know how I'm going to clean that out. You can see it, it cupped that flange out a little bit. I'm sure this design could be revised a little bit to clamp onto the stem better and rely on that lip less but you could flatten this back out and i'm pretty sure all it does is hold the o-ring on there the o-ring makes the seal not not this this doesn't actually touch the fuel rail so if it was between destroying your injector completely or getting it out with a chance of reusing it i would take this every time i don't know about you but now we can get to cleaning these out and actually uh starting the we can actually get to start in the reassembly now which is holy crap it's february and i started doing this in october got the injector wells cleaned up i have the rail set on here it's not bolted down yet so it could be easier to put the rest of the fuel lines back on but i'll show you more what i'm doing on these ones because i figured it out on this one do it here first i'll learn it and then i'll talk about it so i don't look dumb fair enough mm. 
It's in there too. It's kind of. I'm aware that some of that is probably gonna make its way down into the cylinder and this. What are you gonna do? I don't know. I guess it's just uh, cost of doing business. What I do plan on doing is taking, getting it back together and like running the motor over with the spark plugs out to blow out anything that might be in there. Uh, if that does something, I don't know. It's the best we got. So we got the injector and the retainer clippy thing, which by the way, you get these on eBay, they're way cheaper than getting them from one of the parts places. Way cheaper. If you've done this before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you get to put a retainer over there. You kind of get that right like that. You put this together like that. Then you take it, put it down in there, which I cleaned out already the best I could. Asterisk the best I could. Also worth noting, these particular uh, Hitachi injectors have the stainless filter buckets in there, or like the metal ones. Some of them have plastic ones and those come apart on people. So I've read, take your little installer deal, deal who thingy here. Give her the old tap, tap, tap a -roo. Like that, I don't have that many hands, so you can just pretend you just go like tap, 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 roo. Yeah, just like that. One thing I just learned here is I tightened these down and then I couldn't get the anchor bolts back in because they were just a little bit off because these are like ball sockets in here. So don't tighten these down until you got the anchors threaded in. Then you can tighten these down. I noticed whoever put this car together last time didn't do that because all the hard lines up here were all wonked out and they were just like, you could tell that no forethought really went into it. Or if he realized that after the fact, he was just like, you know what, screw it, I'm just putting it together. And it's fine. You, you can do that if you want to, but if there was a bolt in there when I took it apart, I want it to go back in there because there's a reason that somebody put it there. And if there's not a reason why they put it there, great. But. I don't want to find out if there was a reason there's supposed to be a bolt there, you know? When you're driving down the road at night and you just want to go home, do you really want that to be the time you find out why that bolt you didn't put back in was supposed to be there? No. Put it back. Fuel lines all set up, at least for the underneath portion here. Now we're getting this plugged back in, making sure that it clicks. Hear that little click? That's what you want. Click it in. And I had already gone through and fixed most of these plugs with these pins, as you saw earlier. There's still a couple that I have to finish, but what's under here is good so I can get all this valley figured out. And we're getting really close to getting this thing put back together. Well, we got the fuel lines on, best I could. That one back there is not as tight as I want. I ordered some new tools to maybe reach that better. But I'm going to get this together just to try to test fire it and see what we got going on. But I put the the Y plenum back on with the throttle bodies moved over here. It's going good.
Moment of truth right here. Is it gonna run? I have all the, the air boxes and stuff kind of rigged up, but the NAF sensors are plugged in, which is all I really care about. If that leaks, obviously it's gonna leak down there because I didn't bolt it up. That's fine. I'm more concerned about all the other shenanigans around here, like these, which are a couple broken. I taped them off just to bench test this. I did a quick smoke test and nothing came out. So, I don't know. It's either gonna start or it's not. If it does, I'm gonna shut it off real quick, back it up outside so we don't get it all stinky in here. It was torn apart for like four months. I forgot where most of these things went and I had to kind of like refer back to pictures and use my rational thinking to think, okay, this plug is closer to this one. It's got the same thing as that. If it reaches over here, then this doesn't fit there and kind of all that stuff. So no more procrastinating. Let's poke the button and see if it runs. Did I do this right? Is it gonna have a fuel leak? Is it gonna, I don't know. I don't know any of this stuff. Oh my gosh. A big old plume of fog out the bottom, that seems okay. Don't know. Oh, low battery. What the heck, I just had it charging. It just pushed out all the smoke from the smoke test machine. This video was filmed over the course of several months. I think we got the car in October. It was working on it periodically through November, December, January, got it going in February. And it's kind of been an ironing out process since then. We've been daily driving it for a couple months now. It worked well, had a couple problems that it came back. Actually, I don't think I covered that I, <clears throat> I bought a used intake manifold from somebody else that still had the tumble, the, intake runner flaps working so those are functional now and we did the JHM intake spacers it makes a big difference on the temperature hopefully keep those flaps working longer but the, that intake was damaged a little bit in shipping the tumble flap sensor had come off this is the tumble flap position sensor I was talking about you can see it better over here oh well so I had to put some RTV on here because when I smoke tested this there was smoke coming out of those gaps everywhere else checked out fine though if you're gonna work on one of these you need a smoke tester and uh, VCDS. As you can see, some of my bad connectors are still in there because I couldn't find the right ones or didn't want to pay 40 bucks for them. So I put them in there and I just kind of like uh, ran a zip tie through one of it around the bracket that it's going to. And that little bracket bank down here that's supposed to be screwed to the bottom of the intake. I also zip tied that to a fuel rail crossover under there that way Pulling this intake off in the future will be easier, but that won't just be flapping in the breeze. And instead of, because this was kind of like bent a little bit too, I didn't even realize when we first fired up the car that it was not allowing it to open the whole way. So it was kind of castrated from the beginning. And then it started to get worse where it would like open and kind of twitch, try to open and the car would be like Ur -ur -ur. So to fix that, instead of pulling the intake off to monkey with it, I just made this little access hole I don't care, whatever. Eventually, if it really bothers me, I'll make some nice, like, aluminum panel, fabricate something, but for this, it's fine, save my life. Take this little motor off. I messed with this in here, blocked this off with some tape so I didn't accidentally JB weld the arm in place because I bench tested it with super glue first. Took it around, drive it, and it worked. So I knew that that was the problem. If the sensor is not working, it basically kills so much power. It kind of goes into like a default mode. I don't know why, but I don't know. Use the freaking 
a lot of JB Weld to hold this on here, and it's been good. This is the MAF sensor that was all rusty. Changed it with a new one, and it worked fine for probably actually about a thousand miles. And then this one, I think, started to go bad because it threw the code. And uh, I just bought another one because I figured they'll change it and it'll probably fix it. There has not been anything on this car that was giving me a problem that changing the part related to it didn't fix. Like the cam phasers, I had to change those. Uh, I don't know, pretty much just you read the codes, you figure out where the code's coming from and get new modules or sensors or actuators for it and it fixed it every time for me. And those flex pipes down there leak. If anybody in the Charlotte area is an exhaust guy, and uh, wants to fix these flex pipes, I would be happy to give you the business because I do not want to do that. I don't have time for that. I uh, cut those tips off right away because I didn't want to be seen in public with those exhaust tips sticking out three feet past the bumper. It looked like some ricer stuff. So overall for an $8,000 car, if I could go back, knowing the amount of work it would take to do that, buying that car, I wouldn't have bought it. I like it now, I guess, if that makes sense. Oh, and the lower oil pan leaks too, so I have to fix that also. I don't know how much I like it. I think I don't like it until we drive it and I get to hear V10 sounds and I'm like, oh, this car is cool. It's the drug that every single one of these owners gets into. So don't be fooled by the low price if you see one online. It is going to need a lot of work. They almost all leak oil. Or they almost all have injector problems. They're going to be misfiring. They got carbon. I think a random code popped up for a catalytic converter, which I don't want to see because changing the O2 sensors in that car is like an engine out job, and I don't want to do that. So, I don't know. Would I sell it? Maybe. Maybe not. I'm not sure. It has been a breath of fresh air to not daily drive a diesel pickup anymore. It's kind of restored my uh, interest in having a fun street car. Because for years, all I had to drive was Elvis and the Escalade. Because the Escalade was kind of like the race car. And, you know, being in Oklahoma and then in Texas, I only had the tow rig and the Escalade. The rest of everything fun I had access to drive was at home. And I kind of lost that desire to be able to have fun on a daily basis. It's sort of, I don't know. It, it's important to have something fun to drive every day. I've learned that lesson again now. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Like, we're just having a bad day. Uh, just today, coming back from the gym, getting stuck behind a bunch of dumb people, you know, construction, one way, you have to sit there for the stop sign to flip, all that stuff took forever. I come home, I'm angry, I floor it, let it go through some gears, and I'm just like, ah. You pull back in, you're happy, it's fine. If you have a car that has the power to do that, that's what'll get you sucked into it. And you know what? I think it's worth it. Let us know in the comments what you want to see more of. Uh, kind of messing around and stuff in this channel. Because it's for whatever. We can do whatever we want here. Like right now, if this video is about an Audi, I'll show you something that's not an Audi. This is a freaking R5 P7 Dodge engine, and it is for that car. Getting that going. Yes, this will be a video on the main channel. We need to do an extra video about some of these cool sheet metal pieces we just got. We could go into a whole State of the Union update thing here, but that's an extra video in itself, so we'll just leave this about the Audi.